cryogenic. We talk about why we need cryogenic, right? But now, only this class, I might not even put in the exam, but I hope you have an idea. So how do we achieve low temperature? We heard about people talk about liquid nitrogen, right? What it means is that you just immerse it in liquid nitrogen. 77 Kelvin, because its boiling point is 77 Kelvin, so uh, you can buy the dual from the uh, vendor, and then like 160 liter. For example, 60 liter is about 100 US. Okay, I also do this type of experiment. Uh, uh, very cheap, I let the student do it themselves, even they waste it, not a big deal. But if you want to go to lower temperature, 4.2, this is the liquid helium uh, boiling point or, uh, or uh, liquefaction point, right? So it is much more expensive, 20 times more expensive. So when I do this experiment, I always stay with my student because we cannot make mistake. Once the, uh, we make mistake, then we lose. We also need to pay 50% to the school. So actually when we buy, we need to pay $3,000 instead of 2000 mm -hmm. So we, I lost 3000 right, in the research funding, right? So this is why we always keep, when you in the literature, you will see two numbers, 77 Kelvin and 4.2. Because 77, if you are interested in this high range of energy, uh, temperature, then you just buy liquid nitrogen and immerse the whole machine, the whole surface here, then you get what you want, right? And if you want to for, go to 4.2, then you buy liquid helium, but it's just much more expensive. Now, when we say helium, usually we mean helium-4. What is helium-4? You have two protons and two neutrons. This is abundant in the, I mean, the major isotope of helium in, in the, on the Earth. But it also has another isotope called helium-3 that has two protons and one neutron. Not very special now. Uh, and here I have a typo, sorry. Its temperature is about 3.1 Kelvin. I hope I'm right, but not much lower. So it, we are not really buying this, but this is very expensive. I'm talking about one liter, not 60 liter. It's about 3,000 US. And they are the byproduct of nuclear reaction. So if I'm right, someone told me that in US, you, there are only two suppliers. One of them is the Fermi lab, which did a lot of nuclear reaction. That's why they are able to produce this. And if you're with the US, you get half the price. If you're outside, it's double, right? Because it's very, very uh, uh, rare, okay? But we don't use this for experiment directly. We use it to form something called dilution refrigerator, which I will explain more, okay? But remember, we have something called helium free, okay? And uh, so we just keep flowing this liquid. So we cool down to that temperature. If I want to go to 10 Kelvin, you just add a heater to heat it to 10 Kelvin. All right, so cooling is by this liquid, and then heating is by uh, electrical heating, right? But this is not enough for most of the, uh, like quantum computer, right? We need something called dilution refrigerator, which I will explain later. It can bring you down to two mini Kelvin. Now, it's not about the, uh, liquid now. We do have this there, but they seal very well, so you can run it for many years. They just keep recycling. It is the whole equipment being expensive, right? It can range from 200,000 to 1 million, depends on the size for one dilution refrigerator. So this is the so-called dilution refrigerator, right? Again, I want you to learn, but um, don't worry if you don't get off that, but I want to tell you some of the main concepts. Looks very busy. We don't need to look at everything. I just want to show you here is a circulation of helium free. I just mentioned helium free. So it is very expensive. So you need to buy this, right? Uh, if you have leakage, you need to pay maybe, maybe another 20,000, 30,000 in order to uh, feel better liquid helium. But what it does is that it has a mixture of helium free and helium four, two isotopes. Um, helium-4, as I said, it has two protons, so uh, two neutrons, so it is something called boson. If you don't understand, fine, but what it says is just like it, the, the particle can exit at the same state, just like the night. They can exit at the same state, so you have a lot of helium, they exit at the same state. So like a quantum object, right? They are much like an army with the same phase, same amplitude. But helium-3 is different. It is 
uh, only have one neutron, so it spin half. So it is something called fermion, like the electron. Remember when we have electron fill up the uh, atom, they cannot occupy the same state. They always, now you fill up the one S and then one P, uh, one S, two S, two P. So they cannot fill up the same place. So make them different from the helium four, okay? But anyway, uh, maybe too much here. here. Here I just want to show you what happened. So it has two possible fates when you go to very low temperature. Here shows 0 0.87. Uh, actually, it's here at this point, I'm sorry. This is 0 0.87. When you go down, you have some phase separation. On the x-axis, it shows helium-free concentration. Here means that you mostly have helium-4, right? Because I have low helium-free concentration, mostly helium-4 on the left. And on the right is mostly helium four, uh, because uh, sorry, helium free because I have hundred percent helium free, right? So here is mostly helium free. On the left is helium four. Now, just due to the physics, right? They want to separate, and that's why when I cool it down, I have a concentrated phase and a dilute phase. Concentrated phase means I have uh, a lot of helium free. This is helium free rich. And here I have less helium, right? This is uh, maybe have a diluted phase. I actually have a, a 93.4% of helium-4. So, so what? So what happened? So it is like this. It turned out that due to the thermodynamic, if the helium-3 diffuse across this boundary, it is, it is endothermic means it will absorb energy. The reason is because it is a fermion. Once it absorbs the fermion energy, then you can cool down the environment. And that is how you do the cooling through this dilution process. And that's why it is called dilution refrigerator. Why would it diffuse through the boundary? That is because here we have a pump, uh, to, uh, not really pump, a steel to heat it up a little bit so that helium-3 will actually leave faster than the helium-4 because helium-3 have the so-called, you can say lower boiling point or higher vapor pressure, right? So we don't go into details. In summary is that I have two phases, concentrated phase and uh, dilution phase, phase. In the dilution phase, the helium-3 will keep leaving so that I don't have enough helium. And then those helium will go from concentrated phase to the dilution phase. And in this process, it will absorb a lot of energy. Any questions? Now, um, if you have time, take a look and uh, let me know if you have any question. Here, I only want to say one thing. When your helium from concentrated uh, phase, helium free, goes to the dilution phase, you can think in another way. This is just like the helium four is your air. And then the helium-3 is the liquid. It's just like evaporation. The helium-3, when you go to helium-4, it's just like evaporation because it's fermion. It goes to here. This is something called super liquid originally, but it evaporates into the ambient of helium-4, right? This, this we say 6% helium-3 because you have 94% of helium-4, okay? So, and that's why you have this cooling process. I, uh, a lot of things, but uh, it's good to know. Uh, probably won't be in the exam, but let me know if you have any questions. Right? It's my obligation to tell you what it is. Here, kind of show the dimension, about one meter, 700 millimeter, 240 millimeter, and that is the direction refrigerator we all saw earlier also. Okay. Um, maybe because of time, I don't want to show this YouTube, but I do want you to just a few minutes, right? Click on them and go to uh, this YouTube. I show you uh, how uh, my equipment look like and how we do the transfer the liquid helium and liquid nitrogen to do the experiment. Okay. Just a few minutes because you might not see that in the future, right? You might not work in this uh, area.
So when you have cryogenic, one very important thing is you need to keep a good vacuum. Okay, so I want to mention a little bit about vacuum also. Um, why? Because if you don't have vacuum, there are two problems. One is that you could do such a low temperature, what will happen to the vapor water molecule? They will all condense, condense on your chip, and then crystallize, become ice. And not just water, oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, they all have a uh, higher melting point than helium, right? Then you have everything condensed and mess up the whole environment. And second is what? Why do you need vacuum? Uh, to, yeah, to block uh, the heat exchange from higher temperature, right? So kind of reduce the thermal noise in that sense. But the most important is to keep that so that I won't get heat up, right? If you don't have vacuum, you can absorb photon. Again, this is photon because all these are electromagnetic wave, black body radiation. Okay, there are a few different scale. Uh, one bar is the atmospheric pressure. One millibar, of course, is one over 1,000. And one pascal, uh, you may see that, is 0 0.01 millibar. So it's at 10,000 times, uh, sorry, 100,000 100, times smaller than atmospheric pressure, okay? So there are different types of pump to achieve this purpose. One is rotary pump, turbomolecular pump, each of them, here is really my system, each of them has different uh, specification. I forgot to talk about the tall. It's about one millibar, right? Uh, I, I cannot memorize this. Just remember it's about one millibar. So you pump to really low, like 10 to the power negative five millibar. Or in other, the, in other words, 10 to the power minus eight, which is almost 100 million times lower pressure than most very pleasure, right? And then they also have cryo pump, but cryo pump actually is that when you cool it down, then all the water mo air molecule will condense, right? Isn't that then you will reduce the pressure, right? So you cool it at low temperature, then you can help you to go to even lower temperature, which uh, lower pressure. Here's show the so-called uh, rotary pump. This is connected to the chamber that I want to pump. This is the exhaust. Then I have a, this one spinning. And this is something called veins that you have a spring here. So you can uh, imagine when you have spring, you will just extend it to touch the wall, right? So when I'm rotating, for example, when I'm rotating to this region, Then the spring will actually uh, increase to here, and then this will come to here. And what does it do? So when it was at this region, I have a small area. But when I'm rotating, the area keep increasing. So it reduces the pressure. So you will keep sucking in the air from where I want to pump. And here, at this location, it has this volume. When you rotate to this part, the volume becomes this. You press the air out, right? So you keep rotating uh, quickly, then you will be able to pump it to a certain level. Is that okay? Right, this doesn't need to be electronics, right? You, you probably use it at your home already. Right? I, I don't know. I don't know this well, actually. Right? Now, but however, when you pump it to a certain level, the Molecule, the air pressure is so low, but what is pressure? Pressure is that you have molecule, you are hitting each other, right? You have this one going here, this one, uh, then you hit uh, this guy, and then you hit around. So you basically you keep hitting each other, so you have a concept of pressure. Pressure is a macroscopic concept of many molecules hitting each other. But if I keep pumping it so low, they there is a point that they don't hit, hit each other anymore. Like a football field, I put 10,000 people, ask them to run randomly, they will keep hit, hitting each other. On overall, you feel there's a pressure try to expel outside the football field. But now I keep reducing the people, now I only have three people. 
They're running very fast. They have no chance to hit each other. What is the meaning of pressure? You don't feel that, right? And in that case, you are not able to pump it because you just don't transfer the and share the energy among each other. And that's why at this stage, you will use something called turbo, turbo pump, molecular pump. What it does is it have this stationary place. They are stationary at a certain angle, this green one. And then you have this uh, rotating one, turbine blades. They also at another angle. And what it does there is when it is spinning, it is going to hit the molecule, for example, here. Right? Because you're spinning, and then you, you have air molecule inside, right? And then it will hit the molecule and give the mechanical momentum to it. So the molecule will direct it into certain direction. And only those direction one will go to the next level. So, so it's just like you have uh, all these kids running on football field, right? At the beginning, you have a lot of them now. You get rid of many of them now uh, by releasing the pressure. And now you only have a few. Then how do you catch the last 10 kids? You just have uh, an adult just uh, holding something, uh, holding a, a rock and going in a certain direction. Then you will push that kid, right? Just uh, mechanical momentum, push, and then take him out of the field directly to the exit, something like that, right? So uh, we don't need to understand the detail, but that is how you uh, get to low pressure. So you will keep building up pressure until up to the backing pump, which can be this rotary pump, right? This is the part connected to here, okay? And then your chamber will be at ultra low pressure. So here is the system I have. You see that this is the chamber. I have some semi semiconductor chip here. I have a big one, a small one. This is a very tiny one, one millimeter by two millimeter. And this is just a calibration substrate. I have two RF probe. This is a probe tip. They have ground signal ground for you to do the scattering matrix, and which we will learn later. We don't learn the experiment, but later we'll talk about the scattering matrix, and uh, when you design your LNA, you want to maximize the, uh, not maximize, uh, you, you have a certain S21 you want to achieve, and I will put this into the input ports, this on the output ports, and then measure the scattering matrix. I also have this four probe tip, just a regular probe tip that I can connect to some uh, equipment so I can measure the transistor characteristics, okay? Now, what I want to say is, we, we will pump this one by using the quail mole, quail, uh, the turbo pump, tur turbo pump to 1E minus 5 tall. And then we also have a particular region here called radiation shield. This is to avoid the room temperature photon. Again, heat is photon. It's just light, but long wavelength. It's infrared, right? Avoid the energy from coming in. So that's why it's very interesting. You see here at this stripe, this, uh, I don't know, maybe aluminum or something, um, probably, uh, or not conductive, I don't know. Uh, but they are bendable. Because here I need to insert this probe tip, but I want to cover as much as possible. Because if I have a hole here, then the photon can come in and heat up my sample. Okay, any questions? <laughs> Okay, uh, you, you can ask now. I finished this topic, if you want. Scattering matrix, I can quickly explain because we will study later. But basically, in any device, we call it device under test. It can be a, an amplifier, a transistor, or whatever, right? What we go, what I'm going to do is to shoot a microwave pulse. You have the input, let's say V plus, right? And then, it has refraction, V minus. At the same time, you have some, I call it V1 plus V1 minus. You also might have something like uh, uh, V2, uh, should this be plus or minus, I forgot. Is this minus, anyone remember? Anyway, uh, I, I just called uh, this plus for now. You also will have something going to the other part, right? It's just like a water wave. I uh, hit the sh uh, beach. Some will get refracted. Some will go over the beach and continue to transfer, right? So scattering matrix, for example, if we talk about S21, we are talking about what is the 
uh, ratio between what is transmitted uh, divided by what is injected. Yeah. So uh, this is not an analog circuit at low frequency. It is a microwave. So it is all wave mechanism, just like what you see on the pond. Refraction, transmission, and that constitutes a scattering matrix. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead to work on cryogenic models.